Hello, and what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about Unit 3, Cell Structure and Function. This is after talking about Unit 1, which talked about characteristics of life, and Unit 2 talked to make the four biological molecules, uh, whether it be proteins, which make up the actual cell, or we talk about DNA or uh, nucleic acids, which make the DNA and RNA, which code for the proteins, which is life, as well as the two molecules that make energy, quick energy for the uh, carbohydrates and longer term energy for um, the lipids. Um, this is actually a cell city diagram that I found online. Um, the cell can actually be analogous to a city where we actually have like the nucleus for the town hall that uh, controls where the mayor sits. Uh, we have post office for Golgi complexes. We have ribosomes which are the factories that make the energy. Um, and you can see ribosomes and you can see border and you can see lysosomes and more lysosomes and mitochondria and vesicles and more vesicles and um, you can see all the stuff around there. And they're even saying that the roads are the endoplasmic reticulum. So those are cell structure and function analogous to a cell city, which we'll talk about in the B section of this uh, PowerPoint. So let's get on to A. Before we start talking about cells, we have to talk about how we actually know about cells. And the uh, first thing that allowed us to actually see a cell was a microscope, a very simple one, probably uh, much more simple than if you went to the dollar store and bought one of their dollar microscopes. But the individual microscope, and you may actually hear me uh, incorrectly call it a telescope, it's because I'm a geoscience teacher teaching biology, but basically microscopes have uh, a basic design, and we'll start talking about these two knobs that are right here. These are for focus. We have what's called a coarse adjustment focus knob. This is for turning this tube um, up and down fairly quickly, um, hopefully never driving it through the slide, which will be on this stage. but. I'm driving it up and uh, up and down quickly to actually see if you can get it into focus and then once you get it close to focus then you use this fine control knob which is going to actually get you more fine control. <coughs> the uh, telescope itself is held together by this arm. Um, this is also a handle uh, which you can use when you carry a microscope around you grab one hand under here, one hand under the base here and um, it keeps it from falling as well as structurally sound. But the arm actually controls everything that's up on top, so it's where the focus knobs are, it's also where the tube uh, is going to be going up and down as well as holding the objective lenses. We have stage clips which hold the slide, um, holds the slide in place while you actually uh, use another couple of uh, controls which are not on this telescope to move this stage back and forth as well as left and right to actually get it into uh, position so that the light passes through it. We have the arm adjustment. Um, this one actually had a mirror to control light, so if the light wasn't fairly close to directly overhead, if it was coming over here from the side, um, you'd actually adjust this because it would hit the mirror and bounce off uh, 90 degrees away from it, and it would bounce off and you'd actually have this thing set so that the diaphragm is and the stage is this way so you're actually looking down on the stage that way and then the clips are very handy but that usually does not happen anymore because now we have a light source down here rather than a mirror. Then we have the base uh, again uh, one of the uh, basically sits on the table but also basically one of the other two uh, adjustments for holding your hand as well as the arm. Going up here, this is the eyepiece. This is uh, usually exchangeable. The, uh, us on a normal telescope, it's a 10x, so whatever you're using down here is your objective lens. This multiplies it by 10. Um, this is an optical enlargement, so it's not digital, so it doesn't get as pixely. You can get tel microscopes, excuse me, and telescopes that have CCDs, charge coupling devices, which will actually do a digital image, and you can get really expensive, uh, really fine quality digital pictures as well. This is the body tube um, that allows the eye uh, piece to go up and down for focus as well as um, moves up and down when you do these fine and uh, coarse adjustments. We have the nose piece which actually holds the objective lenses. The objective lenses are the object of the microscope. It is to focus and magnify light and then the eyepiece takes that image and magnifies it even more. But you have high power and low power um, 
normally you have uh, a 4x, which makes it 40 times larger with the 10x. You have a 10x, 100 times larger. Um, you could have a 100x, which makes it a thousand times. And you may even have what's called an oil immersion, where you put a drop of oil on the slide and you actually take the slide down and it makes contact with the oil, uh, which makes a very, uh, very clean uh, media to transfer the light through the slide into the um, uh, tube so that you can actually see it uh, much more high quality. This is the stage where the stage clips are held, um, which will also hold the uh, slide. Diaphragm controls the amount of light coming from your light source, so instead of actually changing the light uh, from higher wattage to lower wattage, you can actually use a diaphragm to cut down the light or to open the light depending on what you need to see, and you'll actually see that really clear when we actually use this vi um, virtual microscope down here. Mirror and light source. Um, this one actually has a mirror, but most of them have a light source, which means you'll have uh, need an electric outlet, but uh, light sources do come from directly underneath. It uh, goes right through the diaphragm, straight up and down, uh, makes a nice clean uh, path for the light source. Then we're going to talk about the scientists. Um, these are the scientists that help us come up with what's called the cell theory. Uh, starting way back in the 17th century, mid-17th century, we had Robert Hooke. Robert Hooke was a monk. Uh, monks had lots of free time, and we're going to find that out again with Mager, uh, Grendel, uh, Mendel, Gregor. Gregor Mendel, Mendel Gregor when we talk about genetics. But um, he's a monk, and uh, they do do a lot of church. Uh, services, a lot of uh, religion, a lot of writing Bibles, a lot of uh, talking to people around the area trying to get them to convert. But they also have free time for interests and his interest was actually looking through scope in nature. So what he did is he took cork, which is dead bark cells, and he actually took a really thin shaving, put them on a really simple microscope. Here's one. Uh, this is a simple microscope, but not as simple as what Hook had because this is actually 10 years later. We'll talk what Lewin Hook did with this microscope down here, but he's looking at dead cork cells. Uh, they tend to be really spongy wood. Uh, the cork cells are actually fairly large. Um, there was nothing inside of them because it's dead. It's the, from the bark. Uh, they used cork a lot for um, closing liquid. Um, we use it now for wine, but uh, it was used for water and any other liquids they had back then. Um, Robert Hooke looked through them and he actually saw these sort of rectangular um, blobs and they reminded him of the cells that the monks lived in, the rooms that the monks lived in, um, hallways with room after room after room on both sides. Uh, so he actually called these things cells and the name is stuck. It's not cells like in jail or prison, although I'm sure the monks actually felt that was very similar to where they lived, but they're talking about the cells in the monastery. Ten years later, Antoine van Leeuwenhoek actually uses a microscope. There's the lens. He holds a little piece, a little drop of water up on a very thin piece of metal, and he can move it back and forth, and he can actually um, control it up and down as well. And he starts looking at living cells. So he's the first person to look at living cells. Then we have uh, Matthias Sheldon. Sheldon's actually going to talk a look, or he's going to look at plants, and he's going to tell everybody that he looks like looks like plants um, all are made out of cells. A year later, Theodore Schwann is going to do the same thing for animals. Say all animals are made of cells, and then with the help of all of those and a little bit more time in science, we have Rudolf Virtue, and Virtue is going to actually say cells are the basic unit of all living things not just plants, not just animals, but bacteria and fungus and other things as well. Cell theory. Um, here are the actual scientists that we just talked about down here, and you can hazard a guess to which one's which, but they're all looking at a fairly nice microscope and all wishing they had that back then. But they come up with a cell theory, and the cell theory actually says that cells are the basic unit and structure and function in all living things. So all critters are made out of cells. doesn't matter if they're single-celled, multi-celled, doesn't matter if they were way back when, doesn't matter if they're in the future. Um, life is made out of cells. All organisms are made of one or more cells. So we have uh, multi-celled creatures, which uh, you guys normally think of as critters, but we have a far more... Uh, far more critters that are actually single-celled critters, um, like bacteria, uh, which makes up probably more biomass than all the other life combined.
and that all cells come from pre-existing cells. And this one is the toughest one of the three because if we talk about evolution, and I'm sure that there's a whole lot of the planet that actually does not believe in evolution, and one of the things they said is, where does that first cell come from? So that first cell, uh, we're not exactly sure what happened. It probably was a heterotroph. Uh, we don't know where, how it was created, where it was created, probably in water, and probably uh, 3.8 to 4.0 4 to 3.8 billion years ago. But we'll talk about that when we get to geologic time. We've come up with a more uh, modern version of the cell theory with our technologies and the understanding of DNA, which uh, is the thing that controls all the life, which those scientists back then didn't have. This is actually amoeba down here. Very, um, it's a single-celled creature but it's an incredibly well-designed single cell and it takes its cytoplasm and just kind of pushes it through a blob and can remove to a place to place. It's actually called amoeboid action or amoeboid motion. But the first thing in the, the more ver modern cell theory says that energy flow occurs in cells. Cells have to take energy in order to keep alive, to keep structure and functions going. Number two, hereditary, is, hereditary information is actually controlled by the uh, nucleic acids in the DNA and passed to the RNA, which codes for proteins. So this is how we pass the information from one cell to the other cells, uh, the parent cell to the daughter cells. And lastly, all cells have the same basic chemical composition. Um, they're all made of primarily uh, chinops, and they're all made of the two uh, basic biological molecules, uh, nucleic acids and proteins, and they all use carbohydrates and lipids as a protein source. Then we have prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells are before nucleus, and this is actually true nucleus. Um, prokaryotic cells, incredibly small creatures. Um, this is 0.1 to 10 micrometers, which is a millionth of a meter. Uh, that's a thousandth of a millimeter, those small units on a meter stick. The way you can tell prokaryotes is they're actually very small. They also do not have a nucleus or any internal membranes. They do have to have ribosomes. Ribosomes are what the RNA uh, goes to, to in order to make the proteins, and they're made out of the same things that your cells are made out of, so they have to have that, that, that uh, um, organelle in there or that um, thing in there to actually make the proteins. They do have cytoplasm. They do have a very thick, uh, usually a thick plasma membrane with a coating on the outside. Their DNA is more circular rather than that double-stranded DNA uh, that you guys think of. Um, it does have uh, ribosomes, like I said, and they can have cilia or flagella for motion. Um, but they're single cell creatures and very small. And the largest prokaryote is actually the smallest of the eukaryotes, and they can get 10 times larger than that and even larger than this. And a eukaryotic cell actually does have lots of organelles, and the things we're going to use uh, in the next section of this unit. But these include bacteria and eubacteria, which are bacteria and true bacteria, um, the extremophiles, as well as what we normally think of as bacteria. And they do have what are called gram-positive and gram-negative examples. If you take a look at the cell envelope, if it's got a very thick cell envelope, it's able to absorb a dye, and we call those gram-positive. And if it's not able to can hold that dye but holds a different dye, we call those gram-negative. And these actually include plants, animals, and fungi. And these are the five kingdoms of all life. And now I want to show you this uh, shockwave file, which you can view if you've got a PC. Um, you can't view if you're using Apple. And it's going to say, oh, that's right, I don't have the internet on this computer because where I am. Uh, I'll show that to you in class. Here's an example of uh, gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. You can see that purplish view, and you can see it's actually with what are called gram staining. That's why it's gram positive, and these, the gram stain didn't work. These are gram negative. They actually need a different type of uh, pink. But you can see there, um, these are 10 micrometers that size, so these are probably one or less. 
and these are actually probably micrometers too so these guys are maybe up to five or six micrometers in length uh, size doesn't really have a big difference in terms of gram positive and gram negative it has to do with that that uh, coat coating that's around the cytoplasm in the last slide we're going to talk about in this section uh, Lynn Margulis uh, she's actually a, a scientist uh, 50s and 60s and she's going to come up with uh, looking at now that we understand mitochondria the power house of the cell and the chloroplast the um, capturing of light carbon dioxide and water and making sugar and oxygen and she's taking a look at these and they actually actually looking at them as having two cell membranes which is the only organelles on the planet that have that they each have their own DNA which means they're controlling their own reproduction and they actually multiply by pinching off just like bacteria does this is a mitochondria and we'll talk about all this stuff in B but if you take a look at it its DNA separates and its organelle ish type things separate but they separate by pinching just like bacteria so what Margulis actually thinks about is that maybe this went through a process of called endocytosis and I'm gonna have my kids hopefully look at their uh, uh, word list and figure out this is inside cell moving so this is uh, what we what Margulis actually says maybe is there was a bacterium that's very good at making ATP which is what a mitochondria does for your cell and it actually um, moved into a cell called it uh, moved into a cell in a process called endocytosis and the cell membrane that actually went around from the host and the cell membrane of that bacterial cell actually gives rise to a double celled double membraned uh, organelle and the same thing with um, uh, chloroplast but the mitochondria actually sits in the cell and basically what the mitochondria said to the cell if you give me materials and you protect me and you give me water and everything else that I need I'll produce ATP and I'll share some of it with you um, so it's actually a symbiotic relationship but these are maybe my Microbial, and now they've actually been associated into the cell. They're not utilized by the cell. They don't send in enzymes to break it down. They're actually utilized by the cell, and they pass when the cell reproduces. They pass from the parent cell to the two daughter cells, and because they've got their own DNA, they reproduce themselves, and it looks like it stuck. And the same thing for chloroplasts. So here comes the an aerobic bacteria. Here comes the cyto. Uh, cyanobacteria this anaerobic or aerobic one is going to actually become the mitochondria and this cyobacterium one will become the chloroplasts and I'm not sure um, they're actually saying these chloroplasts are inside of a rounder cell chloroplasts are only in uh, plant cells and that's our stop sign okay thanks for stopping by uh, we'll see you in B actually I'll see you in class too